Hi, welcome to n tv I'm Peggy Robinson. Today's guest is Darren Pelly, and he's going to tell us about his near-death experience. Hi, Darren. Hey, Peggy. How are you doing? How's Good. everyone doing tonight? Good. Thank, thank you for letting were... me be on the program. Appreciate it. Oh you're, oh, you're welcome. I appreciate it. How old were you when this happened? I was I was 30 years old. Yeah. And I, I had some other NDEs, but I didn't know exactly where I was or how I was um, when I was earlier. Um, uh, I, I, have, I became a type 1 diabetic at age 9, and uh, low blood sugar reactions or comas, I would, I would end up going into over the course of so many years having type 1 diabetes. But um, the, the bad um, insulin comas that I would go into, of low blood sugar comas, I, I didn't know where I was in the time like when I was 16 or was in my early 20s or when I was 18 until I had um, an out-of-body experience and near-death um, experience in when I was roughly 30 years old. They they all linked together in one. And um, I, knew, I knew after that, when I was 30, that NDE, that near-death experience and the out-of-body experience, that, that all brought all of them all together. And I knew where I was in all of them, but not as descriptive and not as pronounced as the one when I was 30. So um, I understood the comfort of where I was in the earlier ones, but just not as much detail as the one when I was 30. So it kind of linked them all together, which was such a relieving thing because I, I didn't understand the earlier reactions, low blood sugar comas that I was in. And I didn't understand why I was fighting not not to come back. I was fighting literally n- not to come back in all of those when I was younger. And it makes a lot of sense. A lot of for other other ND years, it makes a lot of sense. Um people don't really realize how why wouldn't you want to come back? <laughs> it's right, nice Peggy? when it finally makes sense, isn't it? And we're so oh. confused by these and don't understand. And then we finally start to put the puzzle pieces together and ah. Oh. Yeah, it's it's like like you said, it's it's that final couple pieces of the puzzle that makes it unbelievable. The centerpiece was missing and the edges maybe. And then you put them all together and you get a true realization of where you were all the time. Can you it's take amazing. us to the day this happened? What was going on beforehand? And yeah, I mean, I was, I was, I was working a lot um, at the time, and um, when I would come home from work, I was exhausted. And there's a couple signs when diabetics go into low blood sugar reactions; they get um, signs. You know, they might, well, some one diabetic might t- tweak his eyeglass, and another diabetic might fiddle his foot, and that means his blood sugar is going low. I actually get tired. Which is terrible because when you're coming home from a long day of work of ten hours and I'm on my feet all day long, I just needed to to eat and, and then take a nap, which was the worst thing to do. I didn't even eat; that was the problem. So I ended up. I, I remember taking a nap, and then um, somehow my wife got me out of bed, and I don't know how she did it. And I was already my blood sugar was below. I would could say well, well below twenty five, easily. Uh-huh. And um, they're supposed to be for normal people that don't have diabetes anywhere from like 100 to 120. And I was down to low 20s. I would, that's what I felt like and uh, passed out almost practically. And she got me out of bed somehow. I don't know how. And I was in the hallway. We're in the hallway outside of our bedroom. We had a two family. We're on the third floor. And the, the, sty- the staircases spiral up, you know. And so we're right in the hallway. And I'm reaching my hand out to her my right hand and I am coming out of my body. It's like a drone. You know how the drones lift up and they go up high and you can see, you know, you can see the ground. And that was the same thing on my body. I could see my body down below me. I was up high. I could see down below my body, my hand still standing, still reaching out to my wife, my right hand or my, I think it was my right hand. And so I was still reaching out to her standing and I, I was lifting up into the corner of the ceiling um, in the hallway and it was up high and I was, it was really, really um, crazy. It was, it was a strange, strange phenomenon. I've never in my previous low blood sugar reactions and comas, I never experienced anything like that. 
I experienced love and peace and, and everything else, but not that out of body experience. I was, I was shocked and I was like, wow, what is going on? And here I am way up in the ceiling and I'm looking down at my, my body still standing, holding out. And that, that, that comes that, that alone, that statement alone brings a huge um, amount of um, understanding. Um, and for me, what I've confirmed is that I feel prior to death, prior to the last minutes of death, prior to anything, I feel as, as, as your soul leaves your body. God, what I would say is God would take your body, take your soul out of your body prior to dying because he, he did that for me. I experienced that. And it was um, not till later that I discovered from a chaplain who was in a hospice chaplain, he would notice how people would die all the time. And he had stories about how people were dying and they were, they were pleasant and something would happen prior to their deaths. A door might open or a wind would come in and they, they were so happy. And then he saw some terrible, powerful faces of people dying as well. And, you know, of course, he was going back and forth with those stories. But um, I also had um, conversations with friends in the Knights of Columbus and other friends in my church that would tell me about their parents dying, their aunts dying, and telling me about how things happened in the room that were similar to um, they knew that the soul was taken from their mom prior to her last breath or prior a minute or so prior to her, 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 her dying. And, and to me, I acknowledge that. I felt that. I saw that in totality of leaving my body still alive. And um, to me, I, I write about that in, in a way that let people know that God, God doesn't let you experience death. He doesn't. He doesn't want you to experience your last breath in the emptiness. He, he wants to take you prior to dying from one life to everlasting life. And to me, I've experienced that. And I, I shine on that every day. And I want people to know that. Not worry. A lot of people worry about death. You, sh you should worry about um, dying and um, suffering, obviously, in, in a traumatic way or something like that. But to worry about your last breath and not breathing anymore, um, the Lord, to me, I know, takes you well before that. And um, I'm not sure if I have any full confirmation from other NDEers that have had experiences and near-death experiences, but I, I haven't really researched that um, highly. But, Peggy, uh, to me, I, I know that for a fact through through my experience, which was um, it's just reassuring for, for a lot of people yeah. to know that. Yeah, I'm the only one that I know of that, you know, choked and felt the pain of drowning because the other end of ears that drowned said so they didn't feel that. And I'm hmm. like, why didn't you, you know, why did I, you know, I was only five. Like, why did I experience, I experienced the full pain every moment of that drowning. Wow. And, and other people was just like, well, they was underwater and then they, you know, lifted up and all these things. And I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> so, you know, I don't know. Yeah. And my first ND was so and he was so different from a second. So you're the only one I've ever heard of that was standing when they had their near was, death experience. I know because I could see I could see my body standing and reaching out, and I was I was standing, which was strange, right? It was strange for me to see my body reaching out to my wife, and I was like, I don't know what happened after, um, with the body that is out of the body experience and being up in the sailing i know what happened after i can describe that in full detail this is what 20 20 some odd years ago but um i remember it as all the the, the things that occurred i, I remember it as clear as day um and and so yeah i was standing which was you know meant something to me it meant something that the lord took me out of my body took my soul out of my body prior to even experience any type of pain and death which to me i i was so happy to write about that for many people yeah. you know and to to know that there are circumstances that that does occur often yeah i've heard of 
uh, pilots and, you know, planes crashing and they're looking down and seeing them and the other people on the ground that hit the ground and died, but they never hit the ground. They're hovering. And, and isn't you know, that amazing, Peggy? Is that remarkable that people, people that can watch this and can, can take that in and understand in the moments of their last breaths or all that it's, it's strongly possible that they, they shouldn't worry. They shouldn't. To me, that's that's a gift that we just gave the viewers, you know, to know. And, and people think, oh, you know, my child or my loved one, they died this horrible way. And, and they focus on that rest of their life. They're so angry that you know, and they focus on that moment. But you don't know. They might not have experienced any of that. You know, even in yeah. one woman, she had a very detailed NDE um, when her husband was murdering her, he was trying everything, poison her, choking her. I mean, trying to drown her in the tub. But, I mean, all this stuff. And the Holy Spirit was with her the entire time. Yeah. And it's a beautiful, just, it's a it beautiful, was a beautiful thing. experience. Yeah, it, it is. And to me, um, it's critical to to tell the world, to tell everyone um, this this particular instance is in, in, in the final days of your life, you know. Um, people worry too much. And to me, it's like wearing is on a on a porch, on a rocking chair, going back and forth. You're going nowhere in your own misery. And that and this this is a gift to me, from me to 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 the viewers. Just and of course through you, your recognition too, Peggy, is to let them know not to. You know, enjoy each day and you know, enjoy each moment. And obviously, if you're in severe pain, you, you should seek you know medical help to not be in pain for the long periods that some people are and before dying, obviously. But in the moments of death, I don't think the Lord wants you to experience it whatsoever at all. Did, and you, if you, take have, go did ahead. you have memories from being on the ceiling? Did it go on from there, your experience? Or did you wake no, up in the hospital or? No, no. I actually, um, from the sailing, everything went to a different location. It was, um, I couldn't see my body anymore. And I was, um, I, I describe it as um, one word, a whirlwind. And it was like, um, I guess you could say a tornado type whirlwind, but it was much larger um, in the size of a house or larger as far as a whirlwind. And I was in that um, and what happened when I was in that, it was, it was so crazy of, of a spiral of a wind that, um, I, afterwards when I came out and later on, uh, weeks later, I decided to look up in the Bible, um, the word whirlwind and it, and it only shows up twice in the old Testament and it shows up with Moses. And I think Elijah's death of, um, they were swept up in a whirlwind, which I so much was um blessed to know that just looking up in the bible and to find out that in the death of moses or the death of um, elijah um they were swept up in a whirlwind which i never thought in a and i never ever thought that i it would correlate to um a scripture in the bible at all and i was blown away i was blown away in that it was almost similar in, in such a way in, in biblical scripture. And uh, that meant meant a lot to me knowing that after the fact. Now, are you saying world in, wind? Or you're saying whirl? Uh, oh, oh, whirl, like a okay, whirl, like eye. a tornado okay. spin. Yeah, whirlwind. Okay. And um, so when I was in the when I was in this world, when I was um, consumed and in, in all around me was the, the laughter of children. That was the first thing that rang through me and through my soul on top of that. So I could hear this simplistic laughter of, of, of a child or children like resonating all around me. And it wasn't like a decept it wasn't like a deceptive seven year old laughter or, you know, it was a young, young, young child, one to two year old laughter of a child. It was innocence all by itself, pure pure purity and innocence of laughter and it resonated through me it resonated through my entire soul and it was all around me it was so magnificent it was remarkable to hear it and resonate around you and through you and the purity of the laughter brought me back to when i was a child when i was younger 
you know, prior to diabetes. It reminded me of that. And I was, I was so much overwhelmed by the, the pureness and simplicity of the laughter of a child, the laughter of children. And that, it, later on, as I focused on that, it brought me to scripture again, where the disciples are arguing with Christ about um, who's going to be at the right hand of Christ in heaven. And Christ mm-hmm. says to them, listen to me, you know, until you all become like children, you will not come into the, the kingdom to the heaven, you know? And so it, 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 it brings back, it brought back to me the simplicity of being on this earth, you know, the pureness of a child and, and to be like the pureness of a child. And it, and it links in with God because after, after that um, I felt this overwhelming love of the Lord fill my entire soul. And it was, it was in connection with the pureness. The pureness of God's love was so large, grandiose throughout my entire soul. It was, it was simplistic like you could ever imagine that his love was so simplistic that it resonated to me that I did it all wrong. It resonated through my soul that his love was so, so simple, like the laughter of this child. I was doing everything wrong. And then that would flutter through my soul. like, oh my gosh, Darren, I was doing it all wrong. I was doing it all wrong down on earth. I was doing it all wrong. Once you instantly feel God's love rush through your soul. And, and it's very difficult. And then Peggy, I think you, you could understand. It's very difficult to describe the love of God through your soul. The love, the peace, the no pain, no hurt, no worries, no time, no nothing. The pure magnitude of his love soaking through every molecule of your soul. It's I, I in in the book that I wrote, I wrote uh, quantitatively. I put you through a dream walk, and I quantitatively describe how much God loves you in this moment. How much love, the magnitude of it. Not even talking about the power that you feel of God's power as well. It's just absolutely mind blowing how massive he just loves you and you alone with him union together throughout your soul and it was it was re, it was remarkable i mean astonishing remarkable i was like you know i couldn't i couldn't understand the magnitude it was so unbelievable i couldn't even think and what was what was so amazing about it was I got a point in time, I got to be able to actually think in my soul of a question that I would want to ask. And instantaneously, before I even thought of the question, the Lord resonated the answer throughout my whole entire soul, telepathically through my whole soul. Everything that I was about to ask, it was because he was one within me completely what did it you was, ask i i i forget what it was it was a no or yes question and i truly forgot what the the, the question was but mm-hmm. i wrote about it that he he telepathically is within you in answering and resonating the answer through you because he knows what you're thinking so when when i when i teach my um catechism class here in sterling i teach 10th grade confirmation I tell the kids, I said, the Lord hears every thought. He hears every thought when he's with you in heaven, in your soul. He knows everything you're thinking. He knows every question you're about to ask. He instantaneously answers it. He knows every thought, every word that you say here on earth. And most people don't realize. It. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah. No, no, yeah. Go ahead, Peg. What it were you just saying? made me think what you were saying. It. I never thought about how God may be happy to finally see us face to face that we can finally see him that he's getting joy and you know we always talk about you know i wept i saw jesus or i was i felt god's love and we say it from our viewpoint but i never really thought about it from his viewpoint until yep. you said something well go that he finally gets to see us see him yeah you know he's watched us our whole life you know and he finally yeah. gets to have that eye to eye contact 
it it's it's it brings you back to the um you know the son and the father the prodigal son story you know if if you really could grasp that hug and the love that soaks in through that father and that son in their heart intensify that by a hundred thousand to the nth power that's the lord within your soul in heaven in 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 you you know and and then he's able to converse and talk instantly and and you know it's it was just um it was amazing. it was it was just crazy intense um and it was there was no worries i i wasn't even thinking of my loved ones I wasn't thinking about anyone and it might sound selfish but i wasn't i was in the gloriness the grace and the glory of him alone and it's so unbelievable. The magnitude is so amazing that it's it just occupies you in in totality of it all. You know, so it's, you it's, weren't it's like that, at any point like I got to go back or I have a family or. No, I I wasn't. You know, it wasn't as long as other what I've I've heard of other NDEs. It wasn't as long as as like uh, getting to the the city of light that I read about and uh, seeing the walls and the, and the, the gemstones and the, the gates and all, I, I didn't even get to that point. Um, un unfortunately, cause I wish, I wish I had, I really, I really do. What did you um, see? I, was, I saw Christ. I saw the robe of Christ, the pureness and the whiteness of, of Christ alone. And I couldn't see his face. Cause I was, at, I was down at like, a, I was looking like kind of up and like, a, a like at his knees and all I could see was this, all oh, this, the whiteness of the robe. And I knew it was him. You could feel it throughout your whole soul. That's exactly I what see, I saw. I, so I could, I could barely, Peggy, I could barely yeah. see the periphery yeah. angles above his shoulders. Yeah. But when I, when I looked up and from his knees point of view, the white of the robe, like I have um, mm -hmm. cows across the street and I see the brown, brown cows and they have um, baby calves and, the white in that calf and the spotted of the white in the calf is is so bright, but Christ's robe is a thousand or ten ten thousand more brighter. And was pure. you in the bright white light? So that's what I thought I saw in the distance, but I saw the robe come to me. Okay. And so I looked up from my knee from the knee perspective, and I looked up and I see this just bright, bright, bright bright yellowish light that's all i see okay. and i could see i could see like you know if you look at the sun your eyes are, are, are twitching and you're trying to look you know or you're not supposed to look at the sun obviously but that's what i was doing because i knew it was christ and i'm looking and i could see like um a slight jawline i couldn't see anything else because it was bright like a like the sun but brighter and more more lightish coming at me in my eyes blinding me and i could see a little bit of of like the the eyebrow you know and that was it that's all i could see and um i asked my priest af afterwards i said i don't i don't understand i know i know others might have like children i've heard children's stories seeing christ in his face and and he told me my priest um locally here in sterling he said to me the reason you didn't see christ's face was because you were not to stay. Yeah, you know, that, that kind of makes and sense. Some claim they saw it. You I know? know some do. Some do claim they saw it, and I'm, I didn't want to tell them that, but right. it kind of made sense. It felt good to me to know that I was not to stay, and I I was not to see the gloriness of him in his face and the definition of it all. You know, um, I, I wish I I wish I did. <laughs> I really did. I really do. I wish I was just, I was able to, but it made talking to my priest and talking, sitting down with him for a half hour in, in the church and discussing this whole story. You know, he, he, he gave me that cause he's heard, he's heard other stories over, over his years of being a priest. I'm sure, you know, and uh, I'm getting a bit of bullshit. I'm sorry, but it was, um, it was amazing. Amazing. And people talk about um, life reveal. So I was I was able to see um, 
my life was only 30 years old, right? So there's not a lot to see, but there is a lot to see. When you're talking about every instance of every word that you spoke, every mind you thought, every interaction for every being that you've been in with from ages zero all the way up to 30, there's a lot to see. Did you see it as like a colorful movie or? Yeah, I saw it as like a flickering through my mind of images. Okay. But what was remarkable is I'm in I'm encompassed with God's love. And in the background, I could feel his love. But I could see the flickering of my life going by in all the instances and the bad ones that I was in my skin and greed and lust or what I wanted and hurting others. And I see their faces and how I affected them in the interactions of my life. And I could see the great ones, the great patience and love and calmness of me with others as well. And you could see that flittering through and he, and he allows you to feel it all. But in the background is all of his love knowing he's there with you. And it's, it's another, it's another testimony to knowing that he's there with you. At any point, was it not just telepathic? Did you hear audible voice? I heard his voice, which was, it was, it resonated through me. So it was like, it was a no. It was a yo, no, it was a no. And maybe, you know, I, I don't remember all the conversations. I felt the conversations coming out. Um, coming out, I was on a stretcher. And this was even, this was, this was great. When I came out, I was on this stretcher and it was up high. The, the the firemen and the ambulance, they had to lift me up over these railings. So here wow. I am coming out after seeing Christ. <laughs> and I'm looking down, right? And I'm looking down from this up high. And I'm like, am I having another out-of-body experience? But I was not I was not 100% conscious, right? So when I was coming out, all I could hear resonate through me was the, the Our Father, the prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I could I could feel that throughout my soul. And not just feel it and hear it, but feel it to the point where I understood every single word and every partial sentence, the definition of the word and the feeling throughout my soul. And when I got into my body, I was chanting the Our Father, like chanting it over and over and still feeling the same feeling I had in through my soul with the Our Father in my body now. And I must have chanted it maybe 30 to 50 times by the time they got me all the way down the first set of stairs, second set of stairs, all the way down outside to my driveway. And I was chanting it and feeling every word through my soul. That was remarkable. And I mean remarkable. Every time I say the Our Father, I say it with the most passion I could ever have in feeling all those words and all the meanings of that prayer. Every single time I'm in church, every single time at every daily prayer that I do, I say the Our Father. And I, I feel it again at times resonating in me. It's so... And, and I read this in scripture at one point that people can feel the prayer through them. And I'm not sure where in scripture that is, but I, I thought I knew of that. And, and I'm not sure if I wrote about it um, as well. But that to me was just beautiful. It was amazing to get to feel the Our Father through my soul. Did you start and talking come, about and, this right away? I talked about it with my wife and I, I kept quiet for a while, a little bit. Um, I was a bit nervous about talking about it. And um, I've been praying about it um, these last 10, 15 years and deciding to, to do something about it. You know, it's a share to me. I'm heavily involved with my church here for the last 20 years of my life and heavily involved with the youth in um in the church and uh, the youth have no connection with Christ in our area of the northeast in America here and and I, I try to bring them to the knowledge of what God's love is like the knowledge of interacting with him in prayer a lot of people don't know how to pray 
they have have never been taught truly i i believe that 100 percent. people don't know how to connect with christ in prayer and i know how to do it not be not because of the nde but before i knew how to do it in some ways i would get markers and i'd get knowledge in prayer and it was a foolish way of praying when i was younger more out of anger than anything else but now it's more it's more intimacy in prayer I get knowledge, I get requests to pray for people, and I teach the kids. Um, and I finally was praying so much outside. I'm on a, I'm on a farm here in, in Sterling, and there's a 10-acre uh, hayfield in back, and I, I just walk that often, and I just pray to God. And I, I asked them, you know, as of late, I was asking them about my path. Everyone asks for their path. What is their what is what does the Lord want want you to do? And I, I, and I was I wanted to reach out, and I was, so I was asking the Lord, and like, what what is? I'm, I remember this. I'm walking about a couple of miles, you know, about a quarter of a mile in in the hayfield right outside the house. I'm looking at now, <laughs> and uh, and I was asking him, I'm like, Lord, you know, what do you want me to do? You know, and I could hear I could hear a resonation of 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 the book. He says, you know, the book. And I, and it was weird. It was like, I was like, and I was, I was kind of feeling like you, I have feeling in me that he wanted me to go ahead and write, a, write, write the story. And so I had to look at finances. I had to look at, I, I'm not a writer. I'm an engineer. And I, I couldn't write a paragraph of my life depending on it, but I could, I could write. I had part dyslexia as well, but I did write. I ended up writing a lot down on, and then Google Docs of all this stuff that I'm saying and, and more of um, prayer, prayers that got answered um, when I was younger, prayers that have got answered now. Um, a lot of stories like that that are really remarkable. People might say there could be a coincidence is there and here, but I've seen way too much, Peggy, in my life that it's not coincidental. You know, it's it's not. It's impossible. I've seen so many signs. I've seen so many angel signs. I've seen so many markers. When you can connect with Christ in prayer, it's like putting on these glasses and you see life completely different. Mm. And you, your life is completely different. Although you see the gloriness in a lot, but you also see the evil just as intentful as the gloriness. You'll see the evil as well in others and in, in, in interactions during the day, which is a good thing as well, you know, for People living in in their own greed and lust that you know they're either hurting or they they really don't know about Christ, you know. And so, in the Indian community, I've heard so much about meditation. I was like, go for it, but I'm sticking with my prayer because it works for me. So it does. I I I think I don't know if you, but I I get I get knowledge. I get a lot yes. of knowledge. If I start praying for somebody, I get the feeling of though. God is listening and God gives me a feeling in prayer. And when I'm talking about sometimes um, I'm, I'm outside praying for an hour. It all depends on who I'm praying for and what I'm praying for. But there are instances where it's five minutes or 10 minutes in the, the phases of prayer that I go through. And sometimes it's I'm out there wandering and praying for someone to be healed, someone that's sick, that needs the intervention of the Lord. And, and that is intense. It really is. It's very intense when you're out there for a half hour and you're you're crying because you have the interaction with God within your heart and soul. And it's so it's not as though like you're with them in heaven, but it's real. It's really amazing to feel Christ and the Holy Spirit just burning inside of you and giving you um, some acknowledgement of the person you're praying for. And then I have found you, as yeah. weird as it sounds. The closer to God I feel, the more psychic I am. So I agree with you. And I didn't want to bring that up. And I don't want to sound like we know things. But when you connect with God in prayer, he allows you to know things. Yes. He, he gives you slight information or slight feelings about the person you're praying for or about what you're going through and what you need. Uh, I always ask for forgiveness. I always I, I start out with gratitude of the nicest, of the most amazing thing in your life that you can be thankful for. 
that really, really touches you. And then I go into Christ-like actions. I describe what I was like with Christ or what I wasn't like with Christ in the last day or so. I go into holy moments that, oh my gosh, I had a great experience, and this was God himself. I describe it to him. I have a full conversation with God in prayer, down to forgiveness of sins and laying them on the chest of Christ on the cross, all my burdens. And I could feel them leave my heart and my mind. That's the connection that people don't understand on how to connect with Christ in prayer. And if they did, they'd be enlightened and they'd get slight knowledge. And some people are just like, oh, I just want to pray right now because someone's sick or my, you know, my husband's sick and I, I, want, I want intervention. If you could connect, you might get an understanding if the Lord wants to intervene or not. And Peggy knows because we've both been there. Mm-hmm. We know how to connect. And it's it's not too difficult, is it, Peggy? No, not at all. No. And it's, it it's, takes surrender. Yeah. And then once you do that and, and you just stay there, you know, I can tell when I'm starting to fall away. I'll start cussing. And I'm realizing I'm I'm dealing with a lot of anger that I need to let go of so I can get back to that closeness with God again. Correct. And, and, um, in in the book that I wrote a chapter six, I I highlight it, um, in that chapter on every phase of how I pray and what I feel. And, And in some circumstances, what happens in certain prayers that I've done in the past, I think I described as well. And I, 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 you know, this knowledge is, is not even, um, in some in some faiths, the, the, the priests or reverends, they don't really teach you how to connect to to the Lord, mm-hmm. right? And to me, it's it's holding a conversation and opening up your heart, getting rid of everything in your mind of all your worries, and having that there and all by itself, the 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 openness of having the Lord come in to you as you pray. And give you insight, give you relief, relief your burdens, give you some knowledge of who you might be praying for. Or or in the end of my praise, I, I ask the Lord sometimes, once in a while, I would say, Lord, show me how today is going to be amazing. Please show me how today is going to be amazing. And there has been moments in, in certain prayers during certain days that he's, those days are remarkable. And that's just off of one ending statement in my prayer after the Our Father, of course. Um, I always end with the Our Father for reasons I just explained in my NDE. Did you share your near-death experience with the students or the youth group? Or I, I tend to share parts of it only to give them relevance of God's love and the connection with God. And, and you know, and, and I teach them this process. I have a, um, a ninth and 10th grade confirmation classes that I do at uh, St. Ridge's here in Sterling, Mass. And um, I end up doing a youth alpha program. Um, it's basic Christianity, open forum, open discussion, um, points of um, topics of Christianity after watching, eating for 20 minutes and a video of um, Christianity concepts like uh, who is Jesus? Was he alive? Uh, why did he die on the cross? How do we have faith? How do we connect with God? How do we and why do we pray? You know, each week it, it builds for 10 weeks until they get confirmed. Ninth grade is, I, it's usually a 14 week session. And I, I try to set up the ninth graders with a couple of weeks and then finishing off. You know, I was curious, these kids there, you would think um, there's certain weeks I can bring in. And there was one week where I could, I could ask, which week would you like, guys? Would you want hell? The topic of hell as a week of video and discussions, or would you want the topic of church and, you know, that the next week for discussion. And I, I usually don't go towards talking about hell, but I know a bit of hell. And I I described that as well in in the book that I wrote, but um, I was surprised that um, the majority of class wanted hell. And these are, you know, these are 10th graders, right? So, Mm -hmm. but I had the most, this was um, this last year. I had the most unbelievable weekly discussion points that we had to talk about questions and stuff. I had the most collaborative effort of the students on hell week on discussing about hell. And I described it to them in detail. The last question is, what do you think hell is like? 
And I described it to them in detail what it was like. And um, some of their jaws did drop, I must say. Now, and, did and you get they, this from the Bible, what the Bible says hell was like? I, I got this from um, um, some readings. I don't think it was from the Bible, but I got it from the intensity of what I was coming out of my reactions when I was younger. Um, I actually felt as though I was coming out of God's hands when I was younger in his grace before I knew where I was and threw hell back and in, back into my body. Cause it was the worst, most insane, intense nightmare. And it was a reoccurring one. Every time I was coming back into my body from these low blood sugar comas. Okay. And I described that to the kids, the intensity of hell to me is the, the greed and the lust intensified through your soul to a magnification that is just insane that you won't want to ever feel through your entire soul of your greed, your lust, your hate, your anguish throughout your life. Um, and I, I described it more intently to the kids of, of what I thought the experience of hell was like. And um, it, it, there wasn't jaw dropping. It was more speechless, you know, because uh, from a 10th, a 10th grader's perspective, they're, they're simplistic. They're like, well, it's fire. It's hot, you know? And I'm like, well, let's talk about your soul in hell. What is it like internally in your soul in hell? And the intensity is overwhelming. It's overwhelming from what I think I know. The end to eat and community tries to push this narrative that there's no bad, there's no hell. Everyone goes to the afterlife. So like, it doesn't matter what you do. And, like, I don't want near that. I don't want to be responsible for that. Yeah. So when I came back, I was, you know, deciding these past years just to, to hope, go ahead and write. And that, that I never wrote a book in my entire life. So um, I ended up self-publishing and took me a, about a year and a half, two years to actually get through it all. It was very difficult, but... Um, I had a, an individual out West that helped me, um, a Protestant reverend that, um, was that wrote books. And, um, the one thing that I asked him that if he could do was through all these experiences that I described, if he could look in, 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 into the Bible and scripture and bring into some relevance of all those experiences that, I, that I've, I've written about and described over a six month period or longer. And I wanted some relevance in scripture um, for all the faiths, you know, not just Christianity, just to have an understanding because it's, we're talking about God, you know? And so um, I wanted, I wanted not to be a, a Christian book. I wanted mm -hmm. to be the relatable to it, an agnostic or an atheist or someone that is a Muslim or Jewish communities and Protestant as well. And, and I, I hope it comes across that way, but, um, you know, the book's just, it's a short, short book, but it's, um, has all this intensity in it and, and of, of my experiences through my life. I've heard which, some authors say they wanted to do that to widen the audience, you know, so they would have a wider audience of people that would want to read it, but. No, my, this is a gift really, to be honest with you. This is knowledge. The pure knowledge. And to me, I'm, I mean, I, if I got one book sale a week, I'm happy that that person's is going to get a lot of knowledge of um, being with God, connecting with God and knowing of, of some unbelievable intervention stories as well. You know, to me, that, that to me is, is, is so fruitful for me to pass it on. Um, to anybody, you know, to me, in my eyes, the Lord lets it rain on all. And I know a lot of people, you can see it on all different social platforms. They all have opinions of the people that do good and the people do good bad. And to me, the book is for all anyone that wants to learn a little bit more in what we discussed. How long you know, it been and, out? And only January, February this year. Okay. 
Yeah. Now, I don't think I've seen you on other podcasts. No, I haven't. You know, I, I was just Trapper Jack, right? Yes, Trapper Jack. I was on his show, um, his podcast, and he had a, a live video, I think, on YouTube as well. And I was, I think, on another one, YouTube, but I don't think it came out. I'm not sure if they're going to edit it and, and put it out there. But, um, you know, on, on to, what to me, what are you talking about? I, I think, um, I forget the name of it. It was like oh. a month or so ago. Oh, okay. Um, my memory's not great. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> yeah. you're too young for that. I know. Well, what made you contact uh, me? I'm curious. I wanted to look at all the platforms, and I saw you, and I, I wrote to you, and I was writing to others as well. I, I mean, just not NDEs, though. I mean, I'm 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 just early in the game trying to get out to the social media uh, platforms. It could be um, spirituality platforms. It could be coming to faith platforms. It could be diabetes platforms. It could be, you know, growing up youth platforms in, in faith. Um, I haven't even touched the tip. I'm at the tip of the iceberg, um, just with NDE platforms on podcasts. I've had YouTube. a lot of people that's never been on a podcast before come on my show. This is and... my second, second time. Really? Right. And, and and some of them just take off like crazy, but people won't give them that initial chance at first. But then it's like once they see there's on another program and they do well, then they'll have them. But like I I love the new ones actually. I I love the stories I haven't heard before. Yeah, and there's a lot of stories. I mean, this is a great thing. I mean, you look at technology back in the 1950s. You, you're not going to hear about these stories, right? Right. You know, only in, in a book or, I mean, just to write a book back in the 50s was probably very difficult to do. Um, but now, I mean, with the Internet and the social medias, I mean, you're hearing so much more. Um, I have friends in work that told me about NDE platforms that I didn't even know about. And they text me and like, you should try this one and that one and, and send them out. So I, I did. You you were one of them. I think I saw you before. I, and just Trapper Jack, I mean. What a, what a nice guy, you know, and I was just failing him out for a month and seeing how it went, you know, and people were, what was great that I really loved is that certain people contact me on my website and on my email on my website, and I have a prayer request on there, and people were reaching out and asking me to pray for certain circumstances within their families and friends, and I, I, I replied and told them, you know, it could be in my mind and my thoughts. What people don't really understand, Peggy, is that when I'm thinking about you right now, Peggy, the Lord hears my thoughts. He knows that I'm caring about you. He knows that. And through his love, through my thoughts of him bringing into the love of you, he's thinking of you as well. And if I ask to have him take care of you, as I'm doing now, he's he would be maybe intervening in some way for you. You know? And... Okay. And I write that to the responses in some of the prayer requests. I said, just me reading, just me reading your request. The Lord has already acknowledged it through my mind. Telepathy in heaven instantaneously. Yeah. And I respond to everybody. I always have, whether it's an email or a Facebook message or something. And a lot of people are shocked. I'm so surprised you, you know, replied to me. And like, they think I'm famous. I'm not famous. You know, no, we're not, but, none of us are right. And, we're just but, simple. You know, it's like, well, I can't just ignore people. No, I mean, the, the magnitude of it, though, if you get a lot of people, let's say 100 people, it'd be very difficult. I mean, I, I work, you know, 40, 50 hours a week. I do a lot at the church. My time is limited. So if I have a lot of prayer requests, I will try to get through them. I mean, I don't want people waiting. But, you know, I, I, I'm I hoping it doesn't get into the thousands because then, then I'm going to have a problem. I'm going to have to segregate my time for answering people who need, need prayer. I mean, that's, that's pure love. The simplistic, the, God's love is so simplistic that just the interactions every single day, just a simple smile to somebody and looking in their eyes and seeing that they acknowledge that smile. That is pureness of God and his love. That's what I've learned in, in my NDE. It's, it's so simple, but pure and complex at the same time. 
and, and it, it's so in depth and meaning and thoughtfulness and of his love as we emulate that to others. Now we all, we all fail. We all sin. We all have bad moments. We all get frustrated and tired, but it's the relationship with God. You know, you might not have a relationship with your wife out through the day or your husband, but then when you're together, you're enwrapped with each other and caring about each other. The same with God, you pray in the morning and then you're leaving enlightened and you're helping people in the instance of the morning and it might, might drain away in the afternoon. If you pray again in the afternoon, you're going to affect other people's lives. Trust me. And the connection with him enlightening in you. And in, in what, what I write about too, is that when you go home after a long day's work and frustration or a long day of, of a hobby, if you're retired and you're frustrated, the last thing you want to do is go home to your loved ones, frustrated and tired. That's the last thing. So I would stop coming home and I would pray so I I could have the burdens lifted through God and prayer to be enlightened with my wife and my family and my mom and my kids. You know, let me tell you, once you connect with God in prayer, once you connect with Christ, once the burdens are lifted, once you acknowledge the greatness of him and what you have in your life, your life is going to change exponentially. And you're going to see things. You're going to see things that are just going to be remarkable. I've, well, I've witnessed it. I've I had, alone. Yeah. Yeah. I've had several guests say, you know, they were doing everything possible wrong. I mean, living a really sinful life. And one day something happened and they broke and they were just, God, if you're real, and I have found things happen when people say that, you know, God, yep. if, I mean, I wouldn't, and you wouldn't, we know God's real, right. Yep. But for people that get so far away and then if you're real and then something may not be that day or that minute, but they know when it happens that this is how they are shown. Yeah. I, I read a great story in a book about a colleague friend of mine that had her little daughter who was sick and you could tell she was up all night. She hadn't, she was crying all night. And I saw her instantly when I came into work and I asked her what was wrong. She told me about her daughter and she was crying and no makeup on like pale white. And she was a mess. And I was, she was a great, great friend of mine. And I told her, I said, I'd, I said, I, I hold, I held her hand. I said, I'm going to pray for Lily. I'm going to pray for her. And I did. And on the way home, I was praying for Lily, opening up to the Lord, asking for intervention. And, and I could feel the Lord. And I pulled over and I'm crying because the graciousness and the glory of him in, in communion, in knowledge, right? And I'm asking him to help her come in, intervene, get rid of all these blisters on her hands and her throat. And she's only two and they couldn't give wow. her medication. So I asked him, I said, just rid of these sores. Let her sleep tonight. Let her rest, Father, Lord, Heavenly God. And I said to him, I said, eradicate them one by one you know, be, before the, the lunchtime or noontime tomorrow, you know, and I'm, I'm specifically asking him and I prayed, pulled over in, in the side of my house on the street. And I, I, I then went, prayed, finished praying and went into the house and I prayed through, through part of the night in my bed. And I had to go up to a different site um, in the morning. And um, I'm coming back to the site where, where Jen was and she's texting me and she's texting me and she's like, bold, come to my office now. When you get bold text with explanation points, you know something's wrong. So I'm thinking something's really wrong with Lily or her two-year-old daughter. So I go up to her office and she's screaming at me, screaming. She's like, what did you do? And she's a mess. <laughs> Again, she's white, no makeup, looked like she hadn't slept all night. She's screaming. She's crying. She's like, what did you do? What did you do? And she's screaming. And I'm like, I'm like, what? I'm like, what's wrong? What, what do you mean? She's, what did you do? And now I can tell just by the, the voice that she's asking me, you know, what was it that I did? And I, and I said to her, she's like, I'm like, why? Why? And she's like, Lily, her, her sores of she's eating popsicles. She wasn't eating anything because her throat was filled with sores and her hands were as well. And she's eating popsicles. She's She's eating popsicles with my mom. And, uh, and I was crying. And as I'm crying now, and I, 
And she goes, what did you do? And she's like tearing a small, what did you do voice? And I said, I said, I prayed. <laughs> I prayed for her all night. And, you know, Jen used to go and she used to, um, when she was little, go to church with her grandmother and she'd fallen away from her faith. And she hugged me and we were crying. And I said, hey, sweetheart, this is this is a marker. You know, this is a marker. This is God intervening. You know, and I said, you should go back. You know, go back. You know, and uh, a few weeks later, she came to me and she was asking me the she needed another prayer request. And I'm like, what's 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 up? She goes, I, I my sister needs to be pregnant. She needs a baby. I said, OK, I, I'm like, I'm like, you know, this, you know, I'll, I'll pray, but it's not doesn't happen all the time, Jen. You know, I'm like, I go, I think he he was trying to tell you something, you know. But it was, you know, like you were saying, Peggy, you know, some people, you know, they ask and they see things and they they know it was God and they're they're shocked, you know, and she was shocked. Like, that's what brought me to that story. She was shocked, but she saw the sincerity in, in my face and she knew of the connection because I was not joking. Yeah. Some people don't her. realize that, you know, we're all his children. We all have the same access. Yeah. True. Um, yeah, I was going to so, ask you. I'm curious. When you were on the other side, did you see your own body? I did not. I saw it out of body before going into the world. One. So okay. when I was coming out of my body up in the Salem, that's the only time I saw my body. Okay, but I like, never looked down. I like, saw your hands or any physical. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Coming. I came out of. I had an out of body experience up and towards the ceiling of the hallway. So I was up in the ceiling looking down at my body. And then I mean, I, when you were with Jesus, did you feel no. like you had a physical self at all? Not the no, one down I, below, but like any no. kind of, okay. I was just no, thinking. it was, it was fullness and, and well, it, you know, it's strange that you asked that because now when I, I reflect on it, it's like, I couldn't see my body, but I knew the fullness of my soul. And I could feel that, right? And I could feel the love of God rush through me and fill me. I could feel the emotions of people in life reveal. I could see Christ in his robe and the pureness of the white. But I couldn't see my my body as in spirit, I believe. I, I didn't see any hands, feet, or anything like that. So it was more of um of a feeling sense. And but then in seeing of Christ, though, which was astonishing. It was amazing, but no, then, I, I it no wasn't more. a long it wasn't a long NDE either. You know, I'm mm -hmm. it could have been I don't know. I'm in the hallway, fifteen twenty minutes, maybe a half hour before the EMTs come, and they probably put dextro shot in me, making me come out of that low blood sugar coma that I was possibly in. Could have been a half hour. Did it feel that same distance of time there? No. No. There was no time. It could have been a, I don't know, fractions of seconds. Everything was happening. And at times, you know, not stage-wise as I talk, but like instantaneously, you know. Why do you no think you heard the children laughing? I don't that? know. I, I think it's... The purity of Christ, the purity of God, the pureness of the laughter, the 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 um, security, the innocence. Um, uh, my brother-in-law across the street, he had um, heart surgery, and they had to stop his heart. And uh, it's a few months ago, and he he's right across the field, and um, he's out there, you know, playing catch with his dog and stuff. And he was out in the field and I, I walked over to him after his surgery, a couple of weeks after his surgery. And I said, I said to him, I said, hey, Kev, I said, I'm so happy. I was praying for him through surgery, of course. I'm so happy that, you know, you're here. He's like, yeah. He said, um, do you mind me asking? I go, how did the surgery go? And he was telling me a little bit and he was out. And then he was telling me 
when, you know, he had to stop his heart. And I, I said, so did I asked him, I said, did anything happen? And he goes, yeah, da, something did happen. And it was just me and him out there. And I was like, all right, well, well, tell me, you know, I would love to hear. He goes, well, you know, at first I started hearing things. And I and then I, I interrupted him. I said, Kev, did you did you hear the laughter of children resonate? And his jaw dropped. Because how do you know that? And it goes, I told the nurse that. And she told me to shut up. She says, Don't talk about stuff like this. You shouldn't be talking like this. In, in the recovery room is what That's he told me. Right. I know. So she would say that, and, is it? And he and but he was odd at the fact that I knew the laughter of children, but he didn't go any farther than that. He was at peace like I was, but he felt the laughter of children resonating, the pureness. And so I described it in detail to him and he was blown away. And then, I, you know, I, I ended up telling him pretty much everything I said on, on this episode here, Peggy, you know, and um, he hadn't heard it before. No, no. I didn't really, I don't really tell a lot of people. I don't know why, you know. It takes time. But yeah. Well, it's 20 years, Peggy. Right? Yeah. Shouldn't have to How take do you that feel? long. How do you feel when you tell it? I don't, it's a good question, actually. I mean, I get emotional because some of those instances are glorification. It's unbelievable. It's so magnificent. It's so overwhelmingly unbelievable. Um, in the presence of God just alone, you know, I thank him so much. But to tell people, I never got to that level of that platform of what it feels for me to tell people. I like telling it just so people know, I think. That makes sense? But do but you go there. back there? Do you feel like you're right there again? Is there some part of you that... So the the love of God and the laughter of children, I know that, I know that heart, like a heartbeat, you know, <laughs> I know it. And I can talk about it and really get like the strings of my heart. You know, I'm almost in full tears talking about it. Writing the book, I broke down many times writing the book, just trying to find the words and describe it. It's so, rem it's so amazing. Um and the so, comprehension, so, I think, don't come all at once. It's like, I'll tell my husband, oh, my gosh, I comprehend it now. And I thought, okay, you said that you know five years ago, but I comprehend it more now. It's yeah. So reliving it is um, is amazing. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you right now, I'm drained now just talking about it. Um, emotionally, uh, that is, you know, because it's. Um, drained? Dra yeah. You know, I'm. I'm, I'm Teary-eyed, crying a bit here okay. or there, but you know, um, it's just—I don't know—it was just such an experience to 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 bring yourself into that back again and to relive that feeling that it's impossible to feel on Earth. You know, it truly is. I mean, it, if you if you think of a love moment in your life, any love moment—I don't care what it is—a hug from a grandmother, a passionate with your husband or wife. Uh, a hug of a young child, whatever it is that it, it really felt a love that soaked into your heart, into your soul. That is a microscopic, and I mean a microscopic breadcrumb of the love of God within you. That is nothing like comparison of being with him in full soul of your entire soul of his love with you. It's astronomically crazy. I, I said that if you took that love moment and you multiplied it by a factor of 10,000, that's impossible for the human body to experience, I would say. But you take that 10,000th factor of that magnificent love moment that you had, that you ever experienced in your entire life, and you have that 10,000th time factor of that love moment, and you put that in highly intense feeling into every single atom of your soul, that's what it's like to be in the presence of God in heaven. It's I didn't that, have that. <laughs> oh. I was fighting. I need to come back and raise my kids. I was just throwing a big old fit. But the moment I was back in my wheelchair, that's when I felt God just gave me my life back. 
Yeah. That's when I felt God's love. Mm. But my situation wasn't over yet. My doctor still wasn't taking me seriously. You know, problem went fixed until the next day. And then I just pushed that I had, I had lost my twins in that end of ESO. You know, I was pregnant. And so there was a lot of mourning and things going on as a young mother. And so it was months later before it dawned on me. Oh my God, that was real. Oh my God, that was real. Yeah. yeah. And part of me was like, no, it couldn't have been. I'm like, it was real. And it was like the clear battle of, of sides. I mean, it, I, I felt like I was going crazy there for a minute. Like, there's so much screaming from this one side. It can't be, but it was. It can't be. It was. <laughs> right. Wow. It can't be, but it was, is. So, yeah. And all the people that say that can't be, there's no way. I get it. I get where they're coming from because it sounds completely made up completely delusional or um you know i have a disabled sister mental illness you know she never talked about things like that but still yeah. i always thought you know you can't go around talking crazy and is and and so yeah so i heard something a while back that and i'd like to find out more about it and i don't know how i can but there's college students going to schools now telling the students about near-death experiences and then they're following their behavior afterwards and they're documenting the children's behavior is a lot better 